to be gathered as the church, especially if you stayed up too late last night screaming at a TV. Come on, somebody. It is good to just release and praise God a little bit together today, this morning. Hey, as the church, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You can... Uh, if you, if you have one of these, um, it's an old analog Bible. It's got pages in it. Um, it doesn't even have to be leather bound. It could be paper. You can, you can do like we did in elementary school, just wrap a brown paper sack around that thing and, and tape it up to, to make it last a little longer. Um, but if you have one of these, I, I would invite you to bring them. Uh, bring them to service with you. Sometimes I forget this when I go on the road, and I, and I just have to use this. And this is okay, too, as, as, as long as the Bible's in it. But either way, I'm going to invite you to turn and or scroll there today. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, we want to get in the habit of having our Bibles with us as often as we can and everywhere that we go. As you're turning there today, I, I want to review quickly. I'm just going to give them to you in the list. I, I'm going to do my best not to re-preach them. But these values that we've been reviewing and, or, and defining over the last several weeks, um, they all started with, number one, delight in Jesus. Now listen, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you all six, but what I want you to understand is the one that I'm going to share today, the one that I'm going to define with you today could determine whether the people that you care about care about the rest of these values. If you don't operate in this final value, if you're not intentional in this final value today, it could be the determining factor for the people that you really care about as to whether they care about what you say you value. Okay, so number one, delight in Jesus. Number two, we foster family. And all of these messages are available for you online and, and in our brand new app that you can go to the app store. Yeah, come on, somebody. We done gone new school. You can go to the app store. We're about a, uh, about a decade behind on this, but it's okay. Better late than never. We've got an app available to you on the app store. You can look that up, New Hope Church Eunice or New Hope Church. You should be able, wow, you should be able to find to find that, and our notes and all of our messages are available to you right there in the app and online. We foster family. We honor all. That was probably one of my favorite sermons to preach. Um, in number four, I was able to share our personal testimony, just the journey that God took my bride and me on, and in regards to generosity, because I believe that Jesus is generous. And I believe a follower of Jesus should be generous. And, and, you, and you shouldn't be saved and stingy. Those two things don't, don't go together. And so God so loved that he gave. And I believe if you're for giving, then you shall be for given. And that was just God's way of speaking to me. And then this number five, we had operate in integrity. I, I really believe this is the one that the church is, is going to be held the most responsible for. Because this issue of integrity is where the church has had probably the greatest lapse. Because we preach holiness and we preach righteousness, which is, which is by the way, very biblical. Um, we preach, you know, being consecrated and set apart. But then we keep secrets. And, and we hide in our habits and, and, and ultimately, the enemy exposes preacher after preacher and so-called believer after so-called believer. And, and every time that the enemy exposes another child of God for their lack of integrity, the church as a whole has a loss of influence across the board. So us being able to operate in integrity... Being very mindful of those things. I don't want to re-preach it. Go listen to that message. And I believe that's, that's where the church maintains its influence. Specifically, as morality continues to subside. Uh, number six. We talked about this last week. We pursue excellence. We don't have an oh well attitude inside of us. Come on. We have an excellent 
spirit, just like Daniel in a Babylonian culture, in a culture of idolatry. Come on, it is very important that we live with the spirit of excellence. Here's the final one. Somebody say, praise the Lord. This is the final one. Is next week, our final value, and it's also our family value at the house. We believe that we should celebrate big. Celebrate big. Now, why would this value fit in with things like delight in Jesus and operate in integrity? Well, let me share two stories with you back to back. When I was, when I was six years old, um, I did everything and way more than my parents probably should have let me do. Um, I, I played every sport. Uh, I was involved in every activity. I, I did karate. I did baseball. I did basketball. I did flag football, peewee football. Um, I, I took piano lessons, and, and I didn't learn how to play the piano. Um, I, I did everything, okay? And one of the things that I'd do is I would have baseball and swim team. And uh, I was on the swim team, and I was on the six and under team, and, and my birthday was a little late, so I, was, I just turned seven, but I, I got in, you know, by the, by the date of my birthday, which is June 9th, if you like to buy presents, so I just put it out there. You can go ahead and write that down. But I, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I was in my Speedo. I was six. It wasn't weird, okay? And, and I was getting ready. I was getting ready for, for this 25-meter freestyle. And, and it was all of the best guys at that time in the state. And, and there was one guy I was going to go up against that I, I think he was an, I think he lied on his birth certificate. Um, but, but I was going to swim against him and he held the state record. And my dad came up to me and he, he showed me the times and he said, look, the only way you're going to beat this guy is if you don't breathe. <laughs> so he said, you, you can beat him. But when they say swimmers take your mark, and I don't know if you've ever been to a swim meet, they used to be able to shoot the pistols with the blanks in them, but now ever since everybody drops to the ground and falls in the pool, you can't do that anymore. So the, they, they, said, they said swimmer take your mark, and my dad said, when they say swimmers take your mark, you need to go and take a big deep breath. And when they blow the whistle or fire the gun, you dive in and don't you breathe until you get, I'm going to be at the other end of the pool. And it was him and my stepdad and my mom. It was like the only time they all, all three got along at the same time is they were all down there and they would laugh at that if they were here. It's not dishonorable. Um, they were all at the other end of the pool and I saw him. He goes, oh, and I was like, you know, like I believed I could. Why? Because my daddy believed I could. And so in that moment, I took a big, deep breath, and they said, swimmers, take your mark, and, <gasps> and I dove in, and I swam. Well, I mean, I used to have an old VHS of it. Uh, a VHS is a plastic box, about a rectangle, about an inch wide. It's got film on the inside of it. You probably saw some in a garage sale recently. Um, anyways, I, I jumped in, and, and I dove in, and, and I swam to the other side, and I beat him. And I, I broke the state record. Now, it's probably since been broken again. But at that time, I broke the state record at the time. And my dad and my stepdad and my mom, my dad picked me up out of the pool. And he was hugging me and loving on me. And, and, and they were celebrating with me, right, because I broke the record and I won the meet. Now, you, you fast forward just a little bit later. Now, listen, my dad, my dad was a great daddy. He was a terrible husband. Great daddy. <laughs> I did not go to my dad for marriage advice. That would have been a bad idea. But he was a, he was a great daddy. But, but he did one thing that, that I'll, I'll, I won't soon forget, and, and it's actually, it's kind of branded into my memory, and so it makes me more mindful of it. See, I, I, I went to him, and I had this desire to, to get drafted and play baseball like my Uncle Randy, who's my mom's first brother, because I thought, man, he, that's what he did. That's what I want to do. You know, I want to play baseball. And, um, and my dad said, my dad told me, I remember this, 11, 12 years old, he was like, Bro, that's, that's not going to happen for you. And I was like, you know, so I took that as a challenge. I mean, he knew my personality. He might have done it on purpose. I don't know. He's like, dude, that's not going to happen. And then he actually named some guys in the Little League. They're like, look, this guy may have a chance. This guy may have a chance. But, but I'm, I'm like, that's not going to, you're not going to do that. 
And so you fast forward a little bit. I was in high school. Guys, I never forgot that. I'm 37 years old, still preaching about it. Uh, I, but fa fast forward a little bit. I was in high school, and I was playing. I was playing, and I did something, and he leaned over to a friend. And he never told me this, but a friend told me later. He leaned over to a friend. I'd done something. I don't know if I hit one out or what. I don't know what it was. It probably wasn't when I hit the one ball out my senior year, but maybe it was. Um, he, and he leaned over, and he's like, man, he's so much better than I ever was. But he never told me that. Told my friend, and my friend told me later, but he didn't tell me that. So you fast forward, and I spent like 15 years of my life trying to prove my daddy wrong. And, and here's why I share that value, and here's why I share this story today. Here's why I think Celebrate Big goes in with things like operate in integrity. Because when we neglect celebration, when we neglect to celebrate, we unintentionally suffocate. Neglecting celebration is suffocation if we're not careful. So look, I, I'm all about correction, okay? This is why this is one of my values. Because if you tell me how well something went, I can tell you how much better it could have gone. If you tell me how good you did, I can show you what you could have done that would have turned good into great. It's just how I am. If you tell me everything that went right on a Sunday, I still have five bullet points in my phone that we're going to talk about in staff meeting on Monday. Could have been the best service ever. We can win by five runs in the bottom of the ninth. And at the end of the game, I can rip everybody in the circle about why we should have won that game in the seventh and what we better do next week or we're going to get our tails handed to us like LSU is for the rest of the year. <laughs> so, I had to make it a value in my life that I didn't just correct people all the time. Because correction without celebration is condemnation. I had to make it a value in my life that if I was going to correct them, then I was going to coach them. And when they began to take strides in the right direction, come on, we were going to have a moment of celebration. I believe it is necessary for the body of Christ. If you want to be a spiritual father and mother, if you want to disciple somebody, you can't just see what they did wrong. We have to be able to celebrate what is being done right. If you're taking notes with me today, and if you're not, you should be. Number one, celebration is scriptural. You can go to eunicechurch.com slash notes. Those that are there available for you. They're also available for you in our app. And if you don't want to use that, then they're available for you on the back of the bulletin. You literally have no excuse for going to church here and not learning the word of God. Like it's, we have removed every opportunity that you have to stand before God and go, well, I just didn't know. You know, I just didn't know what to learn. <laughs> Number one, celebration is, it's scriptural. Let me walk you through some as quickly as possible. Psalm 32, verse 11. Now, these are all referenced. You'll have to go and read the fullness of that um, on your own. But the Bible says in verse 11 of Psalm 32, be glad in the Lord. Okay. What, but watch. Don't just be glad and rejoice. See, one of them is a sense and one of them is an expression of a sense. If you're glad, if you have joy, if somebody did something, if you've recognized that God is doing something, then, then go ahead and say something. Go ahead and celebrate something. Go ahead and rejoice. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. O righteous ones, shout for joy. Shout for joy. I did a, I did a really convicting evaluation recently, I asked how many times I've raised my voice at my children in a positive way versus how many times I've raised my voice at my children in a negative way. How many times have I, have I shouted for joy on behalf of my children 
or even my, because positionally I am a spiritual father to more people than I ever asked to be, which is a great responsibility, and, and I accept it as, as, as a very weighty responsibility and a, and a whole lot to carry, and, I, and I'm fine with it as long as God gives me the anointing and the grace to see it through. But how many times have we shouted for the right reasons, shouted for, for joy and, and jubilation and celebration? The Bible says we should shout for joy, all of you upright in heart, in other words, if you sense it, you should say it. Psalm 33, 1 says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, befitting. What does that mean? It means you were created. Befitting is the praise of the, uh, not just the persecution. Come on, not just the exhortation. But befitting is the praise of the upright. I got to keep going. Psalm 92, 1. It is good. Somebody say, it is good. good. All right, now the rest of y'all say it with us. Somebody say, it is good. It is good good to praise the Lord. Like, Like it's good for your soul to confess with your mouth that God is good and God does good. It is healthy for your spirit and your mind to hear your mouth say. You know, sometimes you don't sense it and you gotta say it anyways. It is good to praise the Lord and to sing praises to your name. That's why we turn the music up so loud. Some of you are like, the music's too loud. Yeah, but if we didn't have it loud, you wouldn't sing nothing. You're like, I can't sing. It's like, God knows, just say it anyways. Make it a confession. Like, don't scare the people next to you. Come sit up front. Instead of trying to get here early to get the back seats and force all the guests to come up to the front of the church. I'm just saying, it may be a new idea. I don't know. The Bible says it is good. It is good. Sing praises to your name, O Most High. Psalm 147.1. I love this. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Translated. Word for word, literally just means, let our God be praised. Like, not just something we sense. Well, God knows I'm grateful. Yeah, but everybody else don't. And by the way, the devil only gets to see your attitude. He needs to see your gratitude. See, Jesus probably knew that the ten lepers were all thankful that they were healed. But only one of them came back and said anything. And when the one came back and said what he sensed, Jesus looked at him and said, weren't there 10 of y'all? I don't want to be part of the nine. I don't want to tell God why I didn't spend my life giving him thanks. I'm going to get back to it. I'll get stuck there if I'm not careful. Let our God be praised, the psalmist says. How good it is to sing praises to our God. If you can't sing it, say it. Why? Because praise is pleasant and lovely. If your life feels more unpleasant and ugly than it does pleasant and lovely, the problem may not be your life. The problem may be found in your praise. There may not be a problem with your situation. There may be a problem with your shout. See, Because scripture is telling us here that if you want to walk in pleasant and lovely and you want to walk in peace and power and you want to walk in the presence of God, then the praises of God will be something that's coming out. So if you want want to know whether you're walking in his presence, all you got to do is listen to your praises. That's good on both ends. Because if you ain't walking in his presence, all you got to do is start walking in his praises. So even when you get stuck in stupid, you can start singing and shouting for joy anyways. Come on. I I said in stupid, not with stupid. I said, don't point. Look here. Look here. Right here. Habakkuk, the prophet. 
spend 17 verses talking about things that are not going so well with the people of God. And I love this. And he gets down to verse 18. He says, yet I. Okay. Despite what's going on around Daniel. Despite what's happening with the kings or the rulers. Habakkuk says, yet I will exalt in the Lord. What it means is he will lift himself up in the Lord. Because I can't lift myself up in all this other stuff. I can't trust all this other stuff. I can't trust all these other people. I don't need to trust people when I trust the creator of the people. I don't need to trust my finances when I trust my father of my finances. I don't need to trust my collectors when I know the one that commands all the collectors. I, I don't put my trust and my faith in all of these temporary things. I put my faith and my trust in the father of the eternal. Habakkuk says, look, I know all this is going on, yet I will exalt i will lift my i'm not gonna stay down here with all these people i'm not gonna stay somebody needs to get it in your spirit today i'm not gonna stay down here with all this stuff i'm not gonna stay stuck in this myth i'm not gonna walk around in my depression and my anxiety i'm not gonna listen to all the negativity i'm not saying i don't have to operate in reality i'm just gonna praise myself up into the perspective that my daddy has because i know that if my daddy believes i can do it if i connect with my daddy in the right way then I can believe it too I'm gonna hurt myself the Bible says I will rejoice in the God of my salvation see all of a sudden it's not weird when people praise because you're praising with them it's not awkward when somebody gets emotional because you understand the emotion. He said, I will rejoice in the fact that I'm no longer a dead man walking on the way to hell. He said, I will rejoice in the fact that I am alive in Christ Jesus. I will rejoice that if God doesn't do anything else for me, as long as I have breath and a heartbeat, I'm not going to praise him for what I think he can do. I'm going to praise him for what he's already done. And if he doesn't do anything else but save my sin-sick soul from the pit of Hades and put me in his throne room for the rest of my days, then I'm going to give him praise as long as I have breath. Let let all things praise. He's going to get what he deserves because I'm not getting what I deserved. That's why the psalmist says, restore, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He didn't say restore unto me my small business account. He didn't say restore unto me the health of my 20s. Ah, come on, somebody. He said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Come on. I know where I am, but I believe in where I'm going. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I told you we were going to get there. This is the best memory verse in all of the Bible. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16. Isn't that good? You can go home today and say, hey, I learned scripture this morning. I got a memory like an elephant. I've never known an elephant to tell me anything that they remembered, but, I don't, but we have that cliche. Rejoice always. I'm going to come back to that at the end. If you turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, just hang out there because we're going to come back to it. Rejoice always. And then to the church in Philippi. Hear me, listen. Paul wasn't just writing to some people whose rights were being threatened. That didn't go over. I'll go over here with that. Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't writing to a bunch of people whose rights were being threatened. Like, he, he wasn't writing to a bunch of people that may have to, have, have to give more earthly mammon to satisfy all their earthly desires. Paul wasn't writing 
to a bunch of people who were frustrated that things weren't happening the way they wanted them to happen. Paul was writing to the church in Philippi. He's writing to people who were having their family members dragged out by their throat and burned on the streets. He's writing to people who didn't take for granted their ability to gather together as the church. They would gather together and pray that nobody came in and killed all of them. He's writing to people who were stretched out in all four limbs by horses until they were ripped apart. He's writing to people who have actually left something on the table because of what they believe. Like their Christianity cost them something. And Paul says this, rejoice in the Lord. Always. Yeah, but Paul, they just dragged my child out in the streets. He says, rejoice. Always. Yeah, but Paul, they've imprisoned me and I, I, I'm in a Roman dungeon. I'm on the inner cell. Paul says, I've been there too. And it was, his, it was his praise when they put him in prison that caused the ground to begin to shake. It was his singing when they put him in the cell that caused the chains to begin to break. Paul writes, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And there was an old song. If I ain't said it 150 times, and I think that they were just playing it until everybody did it. It said, rejoice in the Lord always and again I say again. It was like the song that never ended. We just stay there till somebody ran. Well, somebody got it. They sing it again. Somebody else run. Well, two people got it. Rejoice in the Lord. They saying it again till the guy in the balcony ran and he fell down the steps because the Holy Ghost didn't tell him to. In other words, Paul said this. If it doesn't work the first time, don't give it to the devil. If it doesn't work the first time, don't submit to the enemy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. That was one, one season of my life. And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not speaking against uh, doctors or medicine and hospitals. And, and I'm, I, I agree, there are, there are chemical imbalances and, and sometimes there's hormonal imbalances. And, and, and modern technology and medicine has its place, Okay. With all that said, this is not a, 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 an either-or conversation. It's a both-and. With all that said, we are the most medicated and yet the most miserable of all generations. Listen to me. There's not a prescription for your lack of praise. The only prescription for the lack of praise is praise. The only prescription for a lack of celebration is praise. So I say that. Because I have dealt, in my life, I have dealt with different kinds of senses and feelings. And I have, I have experienced for no apparent reason whatsoever, you can ask my wife, manic, depressive type feelings. There, there are times in my life I, I, people thought I might be bipolar. Which I may have been, because I wasn't living for Jesus. And the, so there might have been a devil on one side and then the other guy on the other side. And I'm going back and forth between the devil and the guy. I don't know. I'm not here to evaluate all that. I'm just saying, there was a time in my life when I was serving God. Now listen to me, hear me. A born again child of God cannot be possessed by a devil. In other words, if you're a child of God, the devil didn't make you do it. If you're not, he might have. I don't think the devil himself is probably spending time on you. He probably sent some little minion, didn't have nothing better to do. But when you're a child of God, you cannot be possessed by a devil. But you can still be oppressed by a devil. 
And I have sensed the attack of the enemy on the outside, trying to suffocate me on the inside. And there were times when it got the best of me, but there was this one time, and I've had to do it again since, and, and I'm sure that I'll have to do it again before too long, probably this afternoon, because Sunday afternoon is the worst time for pastors. Because a hundred of y'all could stand up, shout, praise, clap, and sing with me. But if one of y'all comes to me, just one, it messes up the whole thing. It's just how I am. I care about all of you. If I read one thing on, on I don't even look at social media on Sunday afternoon. I ain't that stupid. I know better. Because one of y'all going to say something ignorant. It's going to make me mad. And I'm going to want to comment, what were you doing today? This is why you need to stay awake when I preach. Anyways, I, I was down. I was down for no apparent reason. My children were healthy. My wife was fine. Finances were fine because we, thank God, have always been able to live below our means instead of trying when, with margin, which is another sermon for another day. But I was down. And I pulled over in a parking lot. And it was a busy parking lot. And my windows weren't tinted. I pulled over in a parking lot. And I said, God, I can't do this, man. Like, if, if this is what it's going to feel like to serve you all the time, I, I got to do something else. <laughs> and I didn't say it this way in first service, but I, I, I didn't hear the Lord audibly tell me this, but I heard it just as well as, as you're hearing me right now. I heard the Lord. I don't know. Maybe he don't talk to you this way. Maybe he just says it to me. He said, shut up and praise me. Shut up and praise me. And I started arguing with him. He said, boy, <laughs> maybe God don't talk to you that way. He said, praise me. You're focused on your problems. You should be focused on your praise. Praise me. And so right there in that parking lot, I turned up my radio and I was singing with Jason. I can't do it today. I was singing with Jason. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy. Ooh, and I started praising him. Then I turned on a new song at that time. It's an old song now. I turned on a new song at that time. Through you the blind will see. Hey! Through you the deaf will hear. And I was screaming. I am free to run. I was in my truck. I am free. I was like, I'm sitting down. I'm still free to dance. And y'all listen, I stayed there long enough. I don't know if it was five seconds or five minutes. I just know that I stayed there long. Have you ever stayed there long enough that when you began to praise him the way you were created to praise him, that the problem was pressed down because the father was lifted up? In that moment, the oppression began to lift off of me and I was able to breathe, to celebrate big. We celebrate small. A lot. This is number two. And the good news is I only have two points today. <laughs> to celebrate big, we celebrate small a lot. Isn't it interesting that our human tendency is to only give God credit for the things that go wrong? Maybe it's just those four people. And the rest of y'all are like, no, I don't do that. But good, praise God. But if you do, the next time that you have a tendency to begin to call out at God. Now listen, he's a daddy. He can handle it. My son can scream at me if he dares. <laughs> and he can come to me when something's wrong. And if God helps me, I'm going to help him. As long as I stay in the right spirit, I won't hurt him too bad. <laughs> Here's what you need to understand. Your daddy can handle your cry. But he would prefer your call. Not just when things are wrong. Certainly, he wants you to come to him when, when things are wrong. But if it's our tendency to only blame God when things are wrong, then why is it not also our tendency to bless God when things are right? See, if you will evaluate your relationships with people and how you treat people, 
it is probable that that is a reflection of your relationship with God and how you're treating God. And this is a simple, practical fix. You don't think it's like, I can't be that easy. I'm, I'm telling you. It is. It's hard to do. It's hard to be consistent in. But if you will learn to stop just looking for the big boulders, come on, and start celebrating the small stones. Come on, he didn't look at Peter and say, you're going to be a big boulder. He said, I call you Petra, which means tiny stone, so that when you learn how to sing like a small stone, you will begin to accomplish big boulder kind of things in the kingdom of God. We celebrate the small a lot because it's our tendency to look for the big and, and only celebrate the big and or miss all the little things that God and other people in our lives actually accomplish. Every Monday, we come in here. We have a rule. You cannot debrief on Sunday. I put that rule in when we went to two services because I preach one sermon. I preach one, one sermon. If I go visit somewhere, like how many services y'all have? One, you better buckle up. <laughs> I preach one sermon and be excited about it. When we went to two services, I got a little tired. We went to three. I said, Megan, don't do that. It's Sunday afternoon. Did you see, to, don't do it, don't, I'm telling you. This is, gonna be, this is bad for our marriage. Somebody come up to me after services and, Pastor, I don't know if you knew this. If I don't know it, don't tell me. This is not your time for counseling. I'm telling you, counselor done gone. I done gave him to you. If you didn't get what he had to say, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. I'm just saying. <laughs> I just know Sunday is not the time to debrief because we're tired. Monday morning before we debrief, we come in this worship center or we go in that office after we get these 53 students, which is the coolest thing that God has ever done in my life. After we get all these, go ahead and praise him if you're going to praise him. Don't give him a partial praise. After we get them all settled down there, we come up here. And we're either in this room or we're in the office with acoustic guitars. And, and man, and we just worship. And we sing. Well, I can't do that. No, you just got to get up earlier. Well, I can't do that. No, you just need to turn the TV off at night. Well, I can't do that. No, no, no. Why don't you take your screen time from last week and devote that to Jesus next week and watch him change your... I done got in something this morning. I have to drink my tea. So we come in here and for, for the first 30 minutes, we praise God and we worship. Come on and dare I say, we pray in tongues in this sanctuary. We pray as the Spirit gives us utterance because we're not here to edify anybody but him and us. And we pray in our personal prayer language. And nobody gives an interpretation and nobody leaves. It's the coolest thing. Now, they can't leave because I'm paying them, but it's still nobody leaves. <laughs> nobody. We just do a bunch of stuff we see in the Bible. And it sets the tone for the rest of the day. And then we go in that office before we do anything else. We got devotion. We got debrief. Come on, we're going to coach. We're going to correct. We're going to talk about all the stuff and some of the people. But before we do any of that, we celebrate. Not long ago, almost every one of us have done it. Because I'm the one that's sitting there like, God, I, I really don't have anything. And the Holy Spirit corrected me once. He said, are you, you seriously? I pay you full time to serve as the lead pastor of a staff full of people at a church and you don't have anything to give me praise for right now? Well, let me pay somebody else. So I figured if God said it to me, when we have staff members saying, yeah, I just really don't have anything this week, I say, are you serious? You mean to tell me I pay you full time? <laughs> And they think it was a thus saith the Lord moment. I was like, it was. He said it to me. I'm saying it to you. <laughs> and so we celebrate. 
we celebrate and we praise God. See, because we have a lot of people, especially when we first got here, because we had this idea of what a, not what a church, we didn't have an idea of what a church was supposed to be. And I need to get some help, so I'll stop pretty soon. Uh, we didn't have an idea of what a church was supposed to be. We had an idea of what a church service was supposed to be. And listen, if, if there even is a biblical term to define it this way, I am as much of a revivalist as anybody I know. I love those services when it's God. I love it when the Spirit moves. I just don't like it when people become super spiritual and inconsiderate of the not as mature believer and they don't care whether they come back again. That junk makes me mad. Because you go home feeling really good about your holiness and I go home with a hole in my heart knowing that I just lost a sheep. So I love this, sir. I love the Holy Ghost hoedown. I love the shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And when I go to a pastor's conference, I'm on the front row. You can go watch. Empowerment conference last week with my hanky. I thank God. Hey, get up, get up, get up. I am. Hey, I'm all, I mean, I love it. I'm for it. And people want revival. Right? We want, we want revival. And I would have people come up to me and they'd be like, why don't we do this in service? And why don't we do this? And why don't this happen? And why don't we do it this way? And I would say, why don't you do it all week? Don't get mad at me for not doing on Sunday what you don't do any other day. I'm not here to set a buffet for you to come set up and eat and then hoard for yourself for another week. If you didn't share what I gave you last week, then I'm not doing it again this week. Now, I didn't say it that way <laughs> until I preached it later on, and they probably knew who I was talking. I don't know if they go to church here anymore or not. I was, well, what is revival? What does it mean that we want to see revival? Well, let me tell you what I think it means, that we go in the office every week and we celebrate the things that God has done. And in those celebrations, we have talked about multiple marriages that were over. I'm talking over. And yet God put it on the heart of a husband or the heart of a bride to stick it out and to pray it out and to press into God's presence. And the Holy Spirit began to work on the heart of that spouse and in the hearts of those parents. And now today, he was supernaturally healing those relationships because somebody decided that when problems arose, the best thing they could do is keep praying and keep praising. That's revival. That today, children still have their mama and daddy in the same. That is a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit in this culture. I sat with a couple this past week that have celebrated 52 years in mar marriage and ministry. You know what I did? I took my wife by the hand and I led them over and I said, y'all pray for us. Because I want that anointing. It doesn't matter if I make it in here. If I don't make it out there, then I don't make it. We had somebody text us after our marriage conference, which you helped pay for. They don't go to our church. They hadn't been back to our church. They sent us a personal text message, and they say, thank you so much for inviting us to this conference. It saved our marriage. We had a student last week, seven-year-old maybe, if she's even seven, tell one of our teachers, ECA has changed my life. <laughs> you talk about make a grown man cry. This baby girl said, this school has changed my life. I'd have done it for five of them. God gave us 53. She said, this school, is, I hated going to school. People bullied me. People were mean to me. They talked about me. They said things around. I didn't like it. I hated it. What she was talking about was the atmosphere. Well, they got to be exposed. No, no, no. You don't expose them until you train them, friend. And if you're sending them into an atmosphere, they better be trained by a different atmosphere so that they have more influence than the atmosphere has on. That's another sermon for another day. This baby said, that school's changed my life. I love going because I, listen, this is a seven-year-old or younger because I get to learn about Jesus and go home and tell my mom and daddy about him. 
We have small business owners that close their store on Sunday so that they can be in services with their families. And they're prioritizing the Father in their finances with first fruits. And their businesses are being blessed. That's revival. Why don't we see baptize, people baptized in the Holy Spirit? Why don't we see miracles? Why don't we see signs and wonders? Because you weren't there when I got a text message about a woman in our church that had had a stroke and was in the back of the ambulance not responding. And about 20 church people started praying. And I'm sure some of them were praying as the Spirit gave them utterance. And by the time she got to Lafayette, she woke up wondering what was going on, responding to everybody. I don't know who told her. I don't know what they told her but I know that the Holy Spirit went in the back of an ambulance and said bring dead things back to life I touched this mind in the name of Jesus see you weren't there when 36 people were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the physical evidence of a personal prayer language that some of them had been seeking for years now don't seek the prayer language Seek the presence. 36 people baptized in the Holy Spirit at the end of the freedom groups and the end of the freedom conference. Prophetic words. Gifts of the Spirit flowing freely in those services. Why don't we do that on Sunday? I don't know. Why don't you? Why doesn't that happen in our services? I don't know. Why doesn't it happen in our society? Please don't save for Sunday what everybody in your path needs all week long. Please don't wait to operate in the gifts in a worship center with a bunch of people that want them to operate. Do it in the world where it's a sign to the unbeliever. See, you aren't here when the 13-year-old was delivered of the demons right here in the front of this church. But I was, and that's revival. See, the reason that we think God needs to do more is because we neglect to give him glory for what he's already doing. You weren't there when the almost 70 year old daughter went to the Shine Conference. And just like we do every week during that opportunity of prayer for healing, she took her walker and went up to the front of that church. She had never received salvation. She had never confessed Jesus as Lord. And she needed a divine touch from Jehovah Rapha. And there in the front of that church, somebody anointed her with oil and laid hands on her. And Jehovah Rapha reached down and said, I've been waiting for you to come forward so that I could show you what I can do. And the boldness and the glory of God shot through her system. She walked back to her chair. She confessed Jesus as Lord. And just a couple of weeks ago, with no walker anywhere in sight, she stepped into the baptismal tank as I held her nose. And I got to pray with her and say, it is by the glory of God and your personal confession that I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rise to walk in the newness of life. That's revival. You weren't at the seventh grade small group with the students that won't even come sit in a service. But they would sit with their friends and they'll eat and they'll hang out. This is why small groups is so important. When are we going to have Wednesday night services again? When are you going to host a small group that serves somebody other than you? I just go there. Last time I checked, it wasn't the great recommendation. It was the great commission. So if you've been serving Jesus for any time whatsoever, then you should be fulfilling the one of the last things that Jesus said. Carry that home and let it simmer a little bit. These students praying. Some of them never before, but that day, confessing Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. One more. Just a few weeks ago, 
See, we have people that go across this city and the Bible says some plant and some water. So when you do what God tells you to do, you don't know whether you're planting or whether you're watering. But then the apostle Paul says, but God brings the harvest. See, I know people who are just almost losing their faith, which is by the way, something I don't even believe you can do. You can lay it down, but you can't lose it. Some people just laying down their salvation over what our government does or does not say right now. And now listen, hear me. I'm not here to argue about shots and I'm not here to argue about masks. Here's what the Lord told me. You want, you want to know what the Lord told me to tell this house about vaccinations? It's about eight people just wake, woke up. Oh Lord, what's he about to say? I know people I love and respect that have received the vaccination. I know people that I love and respect that have not received about the vaccination. Here's what the Lord told me to tell you. You better do whatever God tells you to do. You check with a doctor, you check with multiple doctors. And there's wisdom and a multitude of counsel, but at the end of the day, you better do whatever the Holy Ghost tells you that you need to do. Because some of you will react and respond the wrong way to this vaccination, but some of you need to take it. And I can't tell you what your body's going to do, and neither can anybody else in government or medicine, but the Holy Ghost can. And the Bible says that my sheep know my voice. So if you sit with him long enough, and you ask him, and you listen hard enough, he will tell you whether you're the one that needs it, or you're the one that needs to stay away from it. And that wasn't even in there. We had somebody who had a personal conviction not to adhere to what I believe to be governmental overreach. Hear me, this may get taken down, I don't care. Nobody gets to tell me what's going in or not going in my child but me. Nobody. Now if the Lord tells me to do it, I'm gonna do it. Nobody gets to tell me outside of God's word what does and does not go in this temple but me and the Holy Spirit. And I do not have to obey authority to be honorable to authority. I can do both. So we had somebody call because they have a conviction. It may be a reverent, healthy fear. And they called because there is an attempt to enforce this specific injection. And they called here, because I'm gonna say it right now. If you need help, we'll sign your sheet. If you need help to get it, I'll sign your sheet. If you need help to avoid it, I'll sign your sheet. I'm the shepherd. I'm not even good at pastoring, but I care about people. I had somebody get mad at me one day. I can't even believe you would say that. Yeah, and you're a pastor. I'm not your pastor. Right now, I'm their pastor. And as far as I'm concerned, you're a wolf. Boy, that went over well. <laughs> they called here because they believed that this may be a safe place. And since we invited them and they began to come, they've been here every week since. They don't even live in this city or community. They drive here. Why? Because a church alive is worth the drive. Whenever people learn how to praise, it binds pressure and releases anointing. Whenever you learn how to lift God up, even when you're feeling down, the Bible says he will draw all men. He will draw all women. He will draw all sons and all daughters into his presence. And by the way, the drawing begins with the one who desires it. Draw unto me, says the Lord, and I will draw unto you you because when we praise the Bible says we do the will of God go read it for yourself I'm not putting it on the screen 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 rejoice always verse 17 pray 
without ceasing. Notice he said praise before you pray so that you go into prayer with the right attitude. Then, just to sandwich it in between, he says, give thanks to the Lord in all circumstances. I love this, because some of y'all been wondering why you were created. Some of you are wondering what your purpose was. The Bible says that you were created in the image and for the glory of God. And Paul wrote to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks to the Lord at all times. Why? Because this is the will of God. Go read it for yourself. Verse 18 says, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So if we neglect to celebrate, we unintentionally suffocate ourselves and everybody around us. Come on. But when we praise him, we release his presence because we're not holding him in our heart any longer. We're spreading him with our mouths. All right, I'm done. Father, I thank you for the patience of your people. Lord, let every follower of Jesus in this room right now seek your Holy Spirit. Lord, what does our praise look like Monday through Saturday? God, are we choosing joy? Or are we jealous? Are we shouting for joy? Or do we just yell at the things that we don't like? Are we praising you and celebrating with you and and others? Are we building others up in the faith? Or do we just complain? God, help us to make this powerful and simple yet so difficult adjustment. Lord, we celebrate big. Come on, somebody, you might need to declare that from this day forward. I'm going to celebrate big. If it means celebrating a little, a lot, I'm going to do that. If it means celebrating the big every time I see it, I'm going to do that too. If it means praising God when I'm under pressure, I'm going to do that. If it means praising God when I see problems, I'm going to do that. When if it means praising God through my pain, I'm going to do that. And some of you, before you pray anything else, today is your day. You are the one that Jesus is referencing when he said, all of heaven breaks out in praise and worship if just one sinner repents if just one child confesses Jesus is Lord and I'm telling you right now heaven is leaning over the grandstands waiting to see what you're going to do because the Holy Spirit has been after you since we prayed for it at 630 this morning and now here you sit in the room or watching online and the preacher says open your hands as a sign of surrender and prepare your heart right now to confess Jesus as Lord of your life get ready to give him your life and never take it back again as the church is praying you're preparing right now I want to invite you to confess Jesus as Lord, to give him your life. If you need to do that for the first time or the first time in a long time, if you weren't living for Jesus when you came in this room, we want you to begin living for him before you walk out of this room. Come on, church, I want to invite you to pray as well. If that's you, I want to ask you to pray out loud. Come on, let's use our mouth. Say it together. Let's pray, Jesus, forgive me for forgetting to praise you and give you glory. With my words and my actions, I'm fallen, I've sinned, but you came, you paid for my sin when you died on the cross. When you shed your blood, you spoke a better word. 
you were raised from the dead so I could be born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus. You gave your life so I could live. So take my life and make it yours. May I follow you with all of my heart from this day forward. I surrender all right now in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Now, if you believe it, somebody practice. Your, don't stretch and yawn. Practice your praise today. Hey, the Bible says all of heaven is celebrating over just the one that took the time to confess that prayer. Would you turn your attention to the screen so that we can celebrate with you? Hey, if you just received salvation for the first time, or if you rededicated your life to Jesus, we want to celebrate you and what God is doing in your life. Would you do us a favor and text I believe to 84576? Again, text I believe to 84576. We want to resource you and send you a YouVersion devotional that will provide steps for you to take to further your relationship with Jesus. Also, we want to invite you to go to unishchurch.com, click on the resources tab, and scan the barcode to sign up for Right Now Media. If you're a first time guest, whether you're in person or online, we wanna invite you to fill out a connect card that you can find at unishchurch.com or in a seat back in front of you.